My name is Judy Chu. Sweet, smoky, fiery. Welcome to Korean Food Made Simple. I'm a Korean American chef and food writer now living and working in London. There's always more to life with some spice. And I'm passionate for the Korean flavors I grew up with in the States. In this series, I'm traveling back to South Korea from the buzzing metropolis of Seoul to the swarming beaches of Busan. You can only do it clockwise. That's a lot of work for one dish. <laughs> Introducing the people and places who inspire my cooking. I think you can <laughs> Good. I love this. <laughs> I'm gonna show you a really easy way to prepare it that is so popular. And sharing with you the best of Korean food. It's about harmony and the yin and yang. That smells absolutely amazing. Cannot wait to eat this. I think that would go down really well. I guarantee you, everybody's going to be asking you for this recipe. Korea is best known internationally for its barbecue beef and pork dishes. So good. Kamsamida. Back in my kitchen, I'll show you my simple tasty twist on classic Korean dishes and how a few simple Korean ingredients can transform a meal. I am a chef and I do like to make everything look beautiful. I'm gonna eat these all before my guests arrive. <laughs> Korean food, as you know, has been all the rage in the UK for the past year, but surprisingly, not that many people I find have actually gone out and tried it yet. And um, this is my mission in life, is to get everybody enjoying the flavors of Korean food and also the Korean table. And I do that through my show, presentations like these, and also through my restaurant called Jinju. Um, I actually probably shouldn't be here. I just opened a new Jinju in May for last week, so I'm really tired. <laughs> and I opened up uh, my Soho location on King Lee Street last year in January, in Hong Kong in December, and now my third location a year and a half later in, in Mayfair. Um, and I also wanted to start out with this picture, which looks like a very beautiful tr traditional picture, but for me it really epitomizes Korean traditional food, and as you can see, it's all about variety. You can see lots of different colors, lots of different types of meat on, on the table, lots of different types of vegetable, vegetables, and it really is about variety. And variety is something I'm gonna be talking about throughout this, this presentation, because I really feels, feel that it captures the essence of Korean food. So with any ethnic cuisine, um, I really feel that you have to put it in context, and you do so by showing a map, Okay, so what I found, um, surprisingly, even with a lot of the customers in, at, at Jinju, is that most people have no idea where Korea is, where it is on a map. You know, I've been asked questions if I speak Japanese, if I speak Asian, I'm like, no, Korea's its own country. We have our own language, and it's located right here. It's in between Japan and China, literally, in between. And because of that, um, we share a lot of the same ingredients, obviously executed in very different ways though. Most people know Chinese cuisine, most people know Japanese cuisine, uh, some people know Korean cuisine. Korea has four distinct seasons. It is crazy cold in the winter. I was in Korea this time last year and it was pouring down with snow. Um, and it's also ridiculously hot. And that obviously affects the cuisine as well. So we have a lot of tradition of really warm, hearty soups and stews that hug you and, and hug you back and stick to your ribs, as well as a lot of cooling dishes to, to help you deal with the sweltering hot summers. Um, there's also a bit of history. As you know, cuisine tells the history of a country. Um, Korea is in the middle between these two giants. Um, during the dynastic areas, it was always occupied by China. Most recently, um, 1910 to 1945, Japan occupied Korea for 45 years. And with that, obviously, comes a lot of change of cultures, ideas, everything. So there is a lot of cross-cultural pollination going on between China, Japan, and Korea, even to this day. But Korea, I like to say, as you can tell, is ge geographically located in the middle of these two cultures and also takes the middle ground in many other different ways. Um, Korea is a small country, only 50 million people. And generally, when Koreans speak about Korea, we only mean South Korea. We don't talk about North Korea, <laughs> okay? Um, so whenever we say Korea, or if I say I'm going to Korea, I, I'm actually surprised at how many people think, they're like, are you going to North or South Korea? I'm like, no, I'm not gonna go party in North Korea. I'm going to South Korea. So most pe mostly we talk about South Korea. Now, another thing you'll notice is Korea's a peninsula surrounded by water on all three sides, okay? Korea is also over 70% mountains. 
So there's valleys, there are mountains, there are mountain roots, there are mountain vegetables, there are streams. There are also... It's a ton of water. So we are harvesting a ton from the sea as well. So that also plays into the biodiversity of Korea. Korea also actually considers itself an island because you can't go any, you, you can't go north or no railways or no cars, trucks. You can't even fly over North Korean airspace. Now, another thing that I found surprising is that most people didn't realize that their phone, their Samsung phone, was actually made in Korea. And all of these huge technological giants like LG, Samsung, Kia Motors, Hyundai, Costco, they're actually Korean companies. People always thought they're Japanese or, or Chinese for some reason. So I would say that that's probably what Korea is most famous for is their technology, and that includes heavy industry, Hyundai Motors, obviously, and Hyundai, one of the biggest shipbuilders, semiconductors, cars, memory tricks, chips, iron, and steel. So Korea is one of th the 13th largest economy, pretty impressive considering the Korean War only ended in 1953 that they built up their economy so quickly. Um, one of the things that they haven't done, though, is really promoted their culture. So that is something that we're seeing happening now. Now, there's something called the Korean wave. This is a term that you probably haven't heard of, but it is used commonly throughout the rest of the world, particularly in Asia, and it's called Hallyu. It's like, hey you, but it's Hallyu, okay? And it's a term that was coined by Beijing journalists because of the fast-growing popularity of Korean culture and entertainment that is going on everywhere else in the world. It is so incredibly popular. I've been spending a lot of time in Hong Kong recently, obviously, because I have a restaurant there, and I was meeting a lot of the local girls, a lot of the, the local guys, and they say, we go to Korea once a month just to hang out, to shop, fashion, beauty, everything. So it's, it's really becoming so incredibly popular. And that's because of two things, really. One of them is because of K-pop. I don't know if anybody's heard K-pop, but it's basically Korean pop music. And it is kind of like One Direction, Justin Bieber, Little Mix, um, Spice Girls, times a thousand. And Asia, and I'm talking all of Asia, is crazy about K-pop. And so the popularity of music also, also obviously spreads the popularity of, of all cultures. There are even K-pop schools where young boys and girls go to school specifically just to learn to dance and to sing and to become one of these singers in, in these bands and make lots of money. And they actually change the members, which I thought was funny, depending on which country they're touring in, depending on what language skills that the certain band members have so they can sing in, in the local language. It's also because of Korean dramas. Now, this is something that I've actually seen in the UK also, where there are all these clubs based around Korean soap operas. Now, Korea, if you didn't know, is, are also known as the Italians of Asia. We wear our hearts on our sleeves, we're very dramatic, we're crying, we're yelling, we're shouting, screaming, and so it makes for the perfect culture to have this type of uh, phenomenon come out of, where it's all these love stories, somebody dies, somebody's marrying their brother by accident, all this stuff, and so this is popular throughout the world. It's even popular in places like South and Central America. And with all of that, obviously with any type of media, you always see a glimpse into Korean homes, Korean culture, and Korean food. So, Korean food. This is the trend that is taking the world over. I, I'm hesitant to call it a trend just because I do think it's, it's here to stay a bit longer. Um, it's been going on in the States for a really long time now. Um, you're seeing Korean elements pop up on menus everywhere, and I'm seeing this happen in the UK also. It's showing up in Michelin-starred menus. It's showing up on um, the cheese toasty place on the corner of my block now has a kimchi cheese toasty. It's really incredible. So it's reaching all the low end all the way up to the high end. And also infiltrating restaurants that don't even specialize in anything Korean. It's just being used as a topping, a little bit of a spice, a little bit of a kick, something to add a little bit more of an interesting twist. And as the world becomes more and more global, you're seeing this type of fusion in all types of, of cuisine. Now, I wanted to show you this picture again. So this is what a modern day Korean traditional table looks like. And so you can see some of the similarities in terms of the first picture that I showed you with lots of little dishes. Um, but there's even, you know, soup, there's salad, there's barbecue, there's beef, there's, there's fish. There's so much going on, and it's so fun to eat, <laughs> okay? And so this is the way Koreans eat, and I think that this is something that is also becoming more popular, the sharing concept. So instead of everybody just getting their own little plate, um, you sit down at a table, you cook yourself, you interact, it's very convivial. And also, taking the middle ground in between China 
and Japan, if you think of a typical Chinese restaurant, you often get lots of large dishes, typically on a Lazy Susan that everybody shares. In Japan, you get a little bento box, lots of little dishes just for you. So Korea, again, is in the middle. Lots of little dishes for everyone to share. But lots of tastiness here going on. And what it's all about is that it's all about balance and harmony. If you think of the Korean flag, if you know what it looks like, it has that yin yang in, in the middle that's representing fire and water. And that's really what it's all about, is balance. And that's what the Korean table reflects. Korea was always ruled by the philosophers, the, the, the philosophy class, opposed to the emperors and the warriors. So food very much was seen as medicine for your body and your soul. And every table, every meal needs to have the five colors, flavors, and textures represented. And there is a harmony in taste and nutrition in every single Korean meal. And I think this is why Korean food is also viewed as to be extremely healthy for you. And there is also a golden ratio, which you see displayed on this table, is that for um, you know, seven plant-based foods, for every three meat, meats that, that you have. So you never just eat meat. And um, as you can see here, you know, Korea is all about barbecue and all these things, but there's so much veg that surrounds it. It's not just meat and two veg, it's meat and like a thousand veg. Now let's talk about what Korean food is grounded into. And, these, and this starts with the basic of Korean flavors. Most common ingredients, luckily it's good for you, we are garlic lovers, <laughs> okay? Um, garlic is pungent, um, it's good for you, um, both in raw and cooked forms. Sesame in all forms, oil, leaves, and the seeds. Soybeans in all forms, fresh soybeans, soy milk. Tofu, of course, is made from soybeans. Soy sauce, fermented paste, such as denjang and, and gochujang. This is denjang and fermented soybean paste, which is similar to miso, but it's a bit stronger, it's a bit coarser. Every country has their own version, pretty much, as in terms of every country in Asia has their own version of soy sauce. Onions of all kinds. We love our chilies, even though they're not indigenous to Korea. They're introduced um, in the 16th century. We eat chilies fresh, red, green, uh, dried chilies, and also another fermented ingredient, fermented chili paste called gochujang. And also all of this, all of this punchiness and vibrancy is balanced with a bit of sweetness. And the sweet will come from either fruits, pears, and other fruits. I've seen modern recipes even incorporate kiwi or pineapple. Um, as well as brown rice, malted barley, corn syrup in modern times, which I'm not crazy about, as well as mirin. I'm sure that's a kind of a, a rice wine type, a, a, a cooking wine, and straight up sugar and salt and pepper. So these are kind of the, uh, the, the classic, classic ingredients of Korean cuisine. Now, we can't talk about Korean food without talking about fermentation. And as Charles mentioned, kimchi. So, um, kimchi is probably one of the most famous dishes in Korea. It's kind of a condiment, but it's a condiment that is absolutely ubiquitous. You can cook with it, you can eat it super fermented, you can eat it fresh, you can use it as a topping, you can make whole dishes out of it, you can saute it, you can make a soup with it, you can even use the juice and make a kimchi Bloody Mary, which we do at my restaurant, use the juice and spike it up and make um, a kimchi bernaise, which is something else that we do to serve it with steaks. So it is an ingredient that we are seeing pop up everywhere um, because it tastes so good. But in, and in addition to that, it is also really good for you. Now, when I say kimchi is the cornerstone of Korean cuisine, I mean it is eaten every single day, 365 days a year, all three meals a day. They eat it breakfast, lunch, and dinner, full stop. And Koreans feel that they haven't eaten unless they have had kimchi. And it's considered so important to the Korean diet that even when troops go abroad, they send them kimchi because it's considered an integral part of the morale of the troops. There are over 180 different varieties of kimchi. Kimchi, um, if I use it as a verb, you can kind of kimchi anything, any kind of fruit or vegetable that'll stand up to the fermentation process. So you'll see broccoli kimchi, radish kimchi, leek kimchi, wild garlic kimchi, all different types, even apple kimchi, um, all, all different kinds. It is, it's kind of like the spaghetti sauce of Korea. So every grandmother, every mother, every family will have their own version of kimchi. And it's passed down through generations. And there are actually parties within the communities where everybody gets together and makes kimchi for the entire family as a community. 
Um, kimchi is not vegetarian, just to let you know. Traditionally, kimchi always has um, some deep anchovy stock in it, um, some, some anchovy uh, sauce as well, as well as some salted shrimp. So that makes it um, not vegetarian, but that also gives it that deep complexity of flavor. And so kimchi is also really, really, really good for you. It's a superfood. It's very high in lactobacillus, which is what um, is your gut needs to stay healthy. It's healthy bacteria. It's what's in yogurt. It's really high in veg vitamins. It's high in fiber, detoxification, lots of garlic, lowers cholesterol, reduces the risk of cancer, all different types of things. People have written dissertations about kimchi. Uh, Koreans also believe that they are the only country in Asia that didn't get, ooh, that didn't get SARS because um, they eat kimchi. Don't know if that's true. Another really famous um, <laughs> item in Korea is Korean barbecue. As you say, Koreans are meat eaters, but at the same time, even though Koreans do eat a lot of meat, they have one of the lowest cancer rates on the planet, as well as one of the longest longevity um, age rates. So they're doing something right. Um, also, kimchi is also, and the way of eating, they also say, is attributed to their youthful looks. I don't know about that. <laughs> and another generalization comparing Korea to Japan and China. So Korea are the masters of beef, Japan are the masters of fish, and China are the masters of pork. So in Korea, we are really known to be great barbecuers. And again, there's a sharing concept, and everything is about hitting those five flavors and textures and spices. So here, even with Korean barbecue, it's just not straight up barbecue. It's a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of, of saltiness and spice. And so what I've done to take Korean food, um, I've tried to modernize it. Because the one way that a trend goes global or any type of ethnic cuisine goes global is that you have to make it welcoming and approachable for everyone. So people who have never even had Asian food have to walk into your restaurant and say, okay, there's something on this menu that I can eat, that I want to eat, that looks appetizing. And so I've chosen, we have a bit of a street food concept as well as a traditional concept. I've chosen things like Korea, Korea fried tacos, bulgogi sliders, bulgogi is a traditional Korean barbecue, Korean fried chicken. But also couple that with kind of the greatest hits of Korea, if you will. So, Things like noodles, things like dumplings, so things that are very approachable, such as rice bowls also. Um, when it comes to the barbecue, we actually cook the barbecue for you. Not everybody wants to go out and cook their own meat. It also makes you smell like barbecue for the rest of the night, so it's not all that enticing. But um, at the same time, we try to keep all of the flavors very rich and real and pungent. And we make our own kimchi. We don't buy it in. Um, please try the kimchi that's on, on, on your table. If, uh, I think it's been passed out. So you can tell that it's got kind of all of those flavors. It's a little bit of spice, sweetness, it's acidity, bitterness, everything that you would kind of want. Um, it's kind of, it's stinky and smelly. I mean, it's a force that cannot be, shouldn't be reckoned with also. But, um, but we keep all of our flavors real at Jinju also. Also, um, through my show and um, other mediums, it's really about making the cuisine as simple and approachable as possible and breaking it down and explaining things in ways that people can understand it um, and taking things that are familiar and bringing in references that they can actually relate to. Um, so that's something that I do on my show and um, makes it a very, very easy way. I mean, the hardest thing ultimately is, is getting the ingredients, but now with online retailers and Amazon, et cetera, and growing communities and growing Chinatowns, growing ethnic markets everywhere, it's pretty easy to get a lot of these ingredients. And I'm happy to say that I'm seeing the, the Asian food areas in a lot of supermarkets growing and providing more and more interesting ingredients for everybody to cook with from, 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 from across the globe. Now, I'm gonna have a little bit of a cooking demonstration <laughs> with Charlotte here. And so um, one of the things when, when I was trying to globalize Korean food, um, I decided, I was like, I wanted to make something that was very, very, very easy um, and approachable. And so I decided to come up with a dried spice mix line. And in doing so, I was talking to a lot of my girlfriends, a lot of them who, who don't cook at all, who don't really have much of an interest in, in cooking, are, you know, time short, um, don't have a lot of time. And we decided, um, after looking, and I also looked in, in all of the refrigerators, and they had tons of sauces that had been opened, marinades, salad dressings, et cetera, that were all practically going out of date. 
Um, because when you open up a jar, it's hard to commit to it for the next month and you're going to use that entire jar. And so I was like, okay, why don't we do something that is more dried and so has a bit more of a, uh, of a, of a shelf life. I decided with, with the help of, of a, with Fl Flavory, a Belgium spice company, to come up with this, this, this five spice mix line to try to do that. And so I actually had my girlfriend help me develop a cooking technique. And I have Charlotte here, who has never cooked this, to demonstrate how easy it could be, because uh, she's never done this. Yep. Um, and basically, I'm just taking something called um, my, uh, my Korean barbecue beef rub. So this has everything that you want in bar Korean barbecue beef inside. So it's got soy sauce, sesame seeds, onions, garlic, ginger, all dried form. And we're just going to make some meatballs. Okay, so again here, taking something that is foreign, jazzing up something that is familiar. And then we can make just some, you know, all of a sudden you have like little past canapes, really easy, or an, or an appetizer. And all you have to do, so I've just put some oil in the pan, dump in the, the meatballs straight from, I just got this a, a weight rose, brown it up a little. Now, I was doing this with, with my friend, and she doesn't cook, so I was actually kind of shocked when she first did this, but she just sprinkled it in. And I was like, no, don't do that, because I was gonna make a slurry on the side or whatever. And then she just added water. And you know what, it works, and it's easy. So you don't have to even make a slurry and make the gravy ahead of time. And then you just mix it all around, and you cook it, and you've just got a really flavorful meatball appetizer with some gravy, that easy. And you put little sticks on them, and you have a little past canapé. Now, I also made a fish rub, um, a, a, a fish mix, which I've done in the same way. But these are kind of, because they're dry, they're a bit more versatile, too. And so I decided this would make a great kind of crust to a fish. So I just have some tuna here. And all you have to do is just rub some oil on each side and have this, dip it in this mix on each side, and then pan fry it. And then you're sorted, and you've got like a seared tuna as a main course, a little bit of salad, packed full of flavor. There's seaweed in it, there's ginger, there's all different kinds of spices, and it's really that easy. And the last thing I wanted to talk about also was um, some more flavors considering umami. Now, umami is obviously the, the, the sixth sense, and that's what you get that Moorish kind of addictive, um, savory scent sensation in, in your mouth from. And a lot of that comes from fermentation, and that's why you get that in kimchi. And that's why you get that also in the two pastes from Korean cooking, the gochujang and the denjang. And that's why Korean food, I find, is so absolutely delicious, because it's packed full of these fermented flavors. And another thing that um, I've also come out with in the next slide it's two different sauces that I find that really kind of capture umami is, is a red sauce, which you have on, on your tables, which is just a typical hot sauce that can go with everything, and that's made with gochujang. It's a version of gochujang, which is a fermented chili paste. And then it's sweetened with pear. So you have that kind of sweetness in the pear, and it's got that kind of complexity, but as well as onion, ginger, garlic, all of the great flavors of, of, of Korea as well. And then the other sauce, which I call the uh, Jinmi black sauce. Can anybody identify that? That is black garlic. So black garlic is an ingredient that um, is so commonly used in Asia, but not that common in the West. And um, it is basically garlic that's been cooked. It's not fermented. A lot of people say it's, it's, it's fermented garlic, but it's basically cooked. It's, it's, it's a mallard reaction. So it's the reaction of amino acids reacting with sugars, and that's how you get the caramelization on steaks. And, and the caramelization on bread and things like that. But that gives it that deep umami flavor also. And so this is a black garlic sauce that um, I've come out with also that kind of captures a lot of Korean's fla uh, Korea's flavor as well. And I've just um, fried up some you know, little scallops here, black garlic sauce, and again, you've got some really cute canapes on a stick, quick and easy, just in a frying pan, no special equipment capturing a lot of Korea's flavors in just some, some simple bottles and, uh, and shakes. And can you smell that? Can you smell that, right? So you get that like savoriness still, even though it is coming just from a spice mix. Um, 
in, in, in a gravy and a sauce. And that's about it. So Thanks I so hope um, you guys enjoy Korean food. And if this is your first taste of kimchi, I hope your breath doesn't smell too bad. <laughs> you can go on and uh, mingle happily. But that's it. Brilliant. Enjoy Korean food. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.